Uh, welcome back for our final speaker for uh, this year's CEO Investor Forum here at the AdvaMed uh, conference. And delighted to introduce Bruno Sarda from EY. Bruno's one of the real experts in the world of sustainability, has experience both on the client side, uh, having worked at NRG, the, uh, the great uh, energy company, as well as Dell, uh, also in terms of the measurement side, which we know is a real challenge, a big issue here in the world of sustainability with CDP, and now has moved to the, uh, to the what we call the intermediate side, the advisor side with EY. So delighted here to have Bruno Sarda talk about sustainability. Bruno. All right. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Um, so kind of a hard act to follow after these, uh, these two kind of visionary leaders talking to us about, you know, advances in, uh, in, in, in technology and quality of care and health outcomes. Um, and, uh, but for sure, there's, uh, there's a lot of kind of relationship between ultimately uh, trying to drive to health outcomes and looking at not just kind of social, but also environmental determinants of health. And uh, actually there was a big piece that was just released today, uh, I think uh, in the Lancet uh, by many doctors actually signing uh, a, um, a statement connecting basically the, uh, uh, you know, let's say slower than expected address of, um, of climate change and the risks to human health as a result. So uh, the topics are certainly uh, related. Um, you know, we work for an audit accounting uh, firm and so uh, always have to qu clarify that, you know, when we talk about these topics, we're not giving, you know, uh, uh, professional or, or, or financial advice. We're just making uh, some observations. but. What I'm here to talk about is um, a, uh, a report we just put out. Uh, we've been doing this now for the last four straight years. It's called the Climate Risk Barometer. Um, and in it, uh, basically, we have analyzed over 1,500 disclosures um, uh, from uh, the world's largest companies on the topic of climate and climate risk uh, across 13 sectors, you know, 47 countries, um, one of those sectors, retail, health, and consumer goods, um, about 246 of these companies, about 101 of these companies were in the healthcare sector, and 12 of them were in med tech. So we'll kind of narrow it down as we, uh, as we uh, uh, kind of talk. But the idea here is really to measure uh, in their public disclosures, financial and non-financial, how are companies uh, evolving their disclosure and their discussion of uh, climate risks uh, as it relates to their business. Uh, the framework for that is uh, something we fondly know as the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. Um, it you know, has four parts. Uh, it was actually originally institu instituted by the Financial Stability Board, which is the global government. 2015, actually after the, the you know, um, COP21 or the Paris Accord on Climate, um, and it was presented back in 2017 to the G20 finance ministers for ratification, and is actually underpins really, uh, for those of you in the world of financial reporting or financial, financial analysis, the TCFD is really the, the bedrock of what the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the U.S. has proposed for climate disclosures and inclusion in financial uh, reporting. So as we look at these climate disclosures by companies today, um, just to kind of uh, ground it, that it actually is a framework that is pretty much accepted both by the financial community, the, the business community, and now increasingly regulators uh, relative to how companies should both measure and disclose um, uh, on their climate risks. Four key dimensions. Again, these are not climate-specific dimensions. These are things businesses do uh, and should do, right, around governance, around strategy, around risk management, around metrics of targets. And you can get some uh, examples here of the kinds of things that are expected in these, um, in these disclosures. So what did we find? Well, we found a couple of things. One is we found, actually, that there's been a surge in uh, uh, coverage of climate disclosures across industries. So just year on year, uh, a 14 point increase from you know, back in the 2021 report, 70% of our sample of again, 1500-ish um, public uh, companies around the world, uh, you know, from 70% in 2021 to 84% in 2022, 
making public disclosures about their climate risks. Um, and so, um, and within those four categories we talked about, the one that kind of increased the most uh, was uh, and on a kind of proportional basis is disclosure on climate strategy. So remember, governance, strategy, risk management, and, uh, and metrics. Um, almost 61% uh, disclosed decarbonization strategies. Now, the climate risk uh, disclosures often primarily want to have companies talk about how are they exposed to climate risks and opportunities. So regardless of what they do, how will a changing climate impact their ability uh, to, uh, to both grow, profit, prosper, uh, continue to pursue their, uh, their missions. Uh, but you know, clearly there's also a need for uh, business to participate in addressing um, future risks uh, associated with climate change. And so now you have almost two thirds of public companies uh, in this sample actually starting to disclose about their own process to decarbonize. Uh, many of the markets where this is most advanced, not um, uh, not here in the U.S. or even, frankly, the broader EU, you've got, like countries like UK, Japan, South Korea, Canada, you can see that this actually mirrors typically where there's been the most kind of advances in both regulation and specifically frameworks. For example, in the in the UK, the financial system in the UK has been more advanced in uh, in trying to uh, ask for things like stress testing of portfolios and uh, and disclosures. So. Um, so the, the, the sharing of information has increased generally. Now what we're seeing is there's a bit of a disconnect between uh, what investors are really looking for and what companies are doing still. Basically what you're finding is um, uh, almost three quarters of institutional investors are saying they conduct a structured methodical evaluation of these non-financial disclosures. Um, uh, so not just like are you disclosing yes or no or do you you know, measure your greenhouse gas emissions, yes or no, they, again, they say, do you conduct a structured and methodical evaluation of this data? 67% uh, of investors are saying they make a significant use of these disclosures um, in, in financial decision making. And when you look at the, basically the kind of the pathway to decarbonize the global economy, it's estimated that there's about $125 trillion of capital that's gonna need to be deployed in this transition to a low carbon economy. So of course, the, the, the financial sector is like, well, we have an enormous amount of capital that needs to be deployed. We need data to understand you know, how and where and when to deploy that. If you look then at the uh, right side of the screen, what you find is that most of these climate disclosures we talked about, again, 84% of companies making climate disclosures uh, less than 30% of them including any of that in their financial disclosures. And at the TCFD framework we talked about, again, it's the task force for climate-related financial disclosures. So again, the idea is that at the end of the day, this has to make its way into financial statements, financial disclosures, which is really what you see the, 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 the Securities and Exchange Commission and other financial regulators trying to solve for, is now saying, okay, you're talking about this stuff outside of your financial statements. It's been deemed financially material by central banks, by uh, financial regulators, by, frankly, investors, banks, insurers, uh, asset managers. So therefore, it needs to find its way into your financial disclosures. And that's, um, again, as we can see, there's a, there's a decent amount of ground to cover uh, still. Now, in the, um, in the med tech space, actually, um, it's, uh, it's a relatively more uh, advanced story, and uh, even though it's only 12 companies in our sample of about 1,500 that uh, are in the med tech sector, these 12 actually uh, account for about a trillion dollars of market cap, so not, uh, not ins insignificant in size. And what you can see here is across the four dimensions of the TCFD, it's basically a quality score. So 100% uh, uh, average score or 100% score means basically you're hitting like all the things that the TCFD wants you to do in each of the categories of governance strategy, risk management and metrics and targets. And so, uh, you know, this is a bit like kind of how you how you scoring on the exam, right? Uh, so it's not a percentage of companies doing one versus the other is that what is the average score of companies relative to this basically scorecard of how far along the TCFD uh, are you? And what you can see here clearly is that the medtech space, which is the yellow 
um, uh, are quite far along relative to the rest. And as you can see, even the subsector, the retail, health, and consumer goods, which was 260 companies or 264 out of the 1,500, are tracking very closely to the broader um, uh, community of these 1,500. So MedTech is, uh, is, is farther along, and certainly this is our experience at EY. We work with many organizations in this sector. We see the, uh, I think, the sophistication of, uh, of uh, both governance, uh, intuitiveness of kind of the connection with things like health and climate and social determinants of health, environmental determinants of health have been, um, have certainly been present in their conversation. So within then their um, disclosures, the, 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 the med tech companies we benchmarked within our disclosures, what we find is 100% of them, 100% of them, uh, disclose on climate risks. So there's not a single one that says, yeah, no, climate does not uh, present risks to our business. You can see 100% of them uh, disclose on exposure to potentially acute physical risks. So these could be things like extreme weather events and other kind of exogenous type of events, floods, uh, you know, uh, droughts, extreme type of things. Um, uh, some, uh, most, uh, you know, 83% on chronic physical risk. So these could be rise of, uh, of uh, um, you know, diseases and other things associated with a change in climate. They could be also things like, you know, sea level rise and, and uh, other uh, types of things that are less acute but over time present risk. And then, you know, a lot of what we call transition risks. So things change in regulation, change in consumer behavior, change in technology that could disrupt your business, uh, potentially legal or litigation risk. Um, and then what's also interesting is actually the TCFD really wants organizations to focus not just on the risks associated with climate change, but the opportunities. As we said, again, it's, there's a massive, massive transformation that is expected to occur in our economy. Uh, over a hundred trillion dollars of capital to be deployed, and so as a result, like you know, all the big kind of transformations we've seen through the industrial age, the digital age, etc. There's going to be you know lots of opportunity for organizations to be part of the solution, and others to potentially be left behind if they don't participate in the transition. So as you see, uh, again, 83% of the benchmark companies specifically identified climate opportunities. Uh, in, and, uh, um, you know, all of them saw around energy, around markets, around product services, around uh, resilience, around resource efficiency. So, uh, again, a certain maturity of thinking relative to uh, uh, in, you know, in, in crisis and risk, there's always opportunity if you address it well, if you address it better than your competition, if you prepare for it, if, uh, um, if, you, if you think through that. So... Um, what can they or what should they do uh, more or different? You know, what we're also seeing is, um, you know, emissions are rising. Uh, they're rising, you know, just uh, last year rose by another 6% year on year. The science tells us we need to uh, decarbonize the entire global economy by roughly 40% by 2030. Uh, there was actually just a report out today from the UN saying uh, the current models predict that by 2030, actually global emissions will increase about 10% compared to uh, 1990 levels, which is where this benchmark is, as opposed to being 40% uh, less. So clearly the trajectory is not where it needs to be. It's improving. So this prediction of 10% more uh, by 2030 is actually an improvement over the previous uh, measurement that I think is estimated that it would be closer to 15%. Uh, so, so there's an improvement, but clearly more is needed. And uh, until uh, uh, we kind of get on that trajectory that science tells us is necessary to avoid the biggest risks associated with climate change, then business uh, and people and communities and therefore human health and all of that will be in fact um, at greater risk. Um, and so four things that we think companies can and should do now. One is, again, disclosure is really important. Transparency is really important. We saw it in the presentations from these, uh, these health, uh, you know, med tech CEOs is you need data. You need to know what you're looking at. You need to know what you're working with, but that doesn't solve anything. It just makes you smarter about how to treat the problem. So <laughs> same with climate disclosures and transparency. It gives you information about 
what to do, where to do it, when to do it, maybe with whom to do it, but it's, uh, you know, you're not done when you're disclosed. The disclosure is really the path to action. Um, two is, again, assess your strategy and set meaningful targets. Understand within what you've measured, what should you do about it, and then kind of how should you set, just like anything else in your organization, you know? Like, understand what are you trying to do, by when, who will you hold accountable, so really start working on targets. Um, scenario analysis, we saw actually about two-thirds of the med tech companies we benchmarks actually use scenario analysis, because again, it's not about predicting the future, it's about trying to use a range of possible futures to test the resiliency of your business within that context, so that uh, 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 scenario analysis is actually uh, a, a highly encouraged mechanism in the TCFD to use, there's a bunch of different reference scenarios that companies can avail. You don't have to go create uh, at least the climate scenarios. You can inject all kinds of other business scenarios. You can use other projections about GDP growth, about you know, all kinds of things. Uh, but the, uh, the use of scenario analysis has proved to be really powerful for um, you know, many of our clients, for example, working on TCFD as a way to engage in a conversation and to know, you know at what point, under what type of climate scenario does our business strategy potentially um, become uh, too vulnerable or less, uh, less resilient. Um, and then track performance in real time. Again, um, know, know what you're trying to do and know kind of how you're doing against it, uh, uh, just like you're trying to measure other operational uh, 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 you know, uh, data in your organization. And then four, fact is, many organizations, most organizations have shared concerns, shared problems, uh, whether it's at a community scale and, you know, geographically, if you're trying to build resilience, if you're trying to kind of uh, create more, uh, more kind of elasticity in the systems, whether it's in your supply chains, again, most companies in a sector have shared suppliers, they have shared constraints or access to resources. Um, and so whether it's in the, you know, pharma, for example, relies a lot on, on products from nature and from, uh, you know, biodiversity. Um, uh, so, you know, collaborate to succeed. Try to find out, you know, what are the pre-competitive uh, measures and aspects that you can work on to uh, both share the cost, uh, share the risk, uh, and frankly, uh, you know, share the good ideas. Uh, you know, some of these problems uh, should not become, uh, you know, necessarily a competitive advantage. You know, how you manage risk and how you bring new solutions and ideas to market should be a competitive advantage, but how you make, for example, your supply chain more resilient or, um, you know, reduce risk always all the way down into your value chain and to your consumer may uh, be an area of, uh, of shared interest and shared concern. So. Um, uh, collaborate to succeed and find uh, find willing partners either within your own sector, within your value chain, within ecosystem of uh, of uh, you know within the financial community. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interaction with you know with insurers, with bankers, with investors, with companies, uh, with professional services, all trying to figure out you know what is the um, what is the right answer? So um, that's, uh, that's a quick summary of our climate risk barometer. Uh, it's, uh, it's available on ey.com if you, uh, you want to go dig in deeper. Uh, but uh, thanks for your attention. And if there's any uh, questions, happy to answer them. In one of the slides, you talked about that the score uh, for the sample increased from 38% to 42% in 20, 2021, 38%, 42% in 2022. Uh, what is the score? Who did the score? Just briefly, how did you do the score, or who, who did the score? So this is the, um, across the four um, dimensions of the TCFD, governance, strategy, um, risk management, and metrics, uh, and measurement, um, there's kind of a, a, a scorecard, basically. There's a, you know, what is considered a complete disclosure within each of those four dimensions. So again, the, the, actually, let's see if I can figure out how to go back. So, you know, in this here, um, the, um, so the, this 100% um, means basically you're doing everything that TCFD says you should. Uh, and um, uh, these were the average scores across the four categories. Uh, what we saw in, in the, the, the metric you referenced is that of the four categories, the one that improved the most year on year was on the strategy front. Um, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's uh, basically a, 
a qualitative or a quantitative approach to trying to rate uh, the quality of disclosures among the four categories. How much of the, the uh, scores you're looking at are forward-looking versus backward-looking at this point? Are they all backward? At this point, these scores are literally uh, evaluating the completeness of disclosures that have occurred. Okay. So, but part of what you're evaluating is what is being disclosed, and part of that is, uh, you know, looking at, for example, things like strategy, uh, which is, you know, how are you looking forward? But the, the scores themselves are uh, basically just trying to evaluate what is the, the completeness and quality of climate disclosures um, as they, uh, you know, within this current year. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.